I'm going to be discussing today uh, the interpretation of fascism by three major Austrian economists, uh, Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich Hayek, and Wilhelm Röpke. And my, I'm going to limit the topic in this way, that by fascism, I'm not going to cover the whole, all the governments that have been called fascists, or were fascists, such as the Italian fascism, or Romanian fascism. I'm going to consider only the German National Socialism, which was what each of these economists devoted a book, or at least a large part of a book, to analyzing. And I'll be dealing with their interpretation of the, the Nazi uh, system and, uh, and their, their very distinctive analysis. Of All three economists had basically the same interpretation of national socialism. There are minor differences of emphasis, but they all had the same, really the same model. Now, I think we can best understand what this model is by looking at what the way of understanding national socialism that was characteristic of the 1940s, which was when all three of these authors wrote their respective books on national socialism. Now, uh, surprisingly, if we think of the name of the Nazi party, which is the National Socialist German Workers' Party, uh, the, surprisingly, the interpretation that was dominant during the 1940s of the Nazi system was that the Nazi system was the a stage of capitalism, a final stage of capitalism, which is perhaps prima facie implausible since it's a National Socialist Party. One wouldn't think this is a capitalist system. But what people who supported this view thought was that at the Depression, it showed that uh, capitalism under a d democratic government couldn't survive, that capitalism was in danger of collapsing. So the wealthy capitalists really supported, had to support an armed takeover of the government in order to keep control. And in, their, in, in, the, in this interpretation, the Nazi economy was really dominated by big business interests. We can see this interpretation, say, in the book by the... Uh, the uh, Anglo-Indian Arpam Dutt fascism and social revolution, and, it, and then in the probably the most important book giving this interpretation was by the uh, German social democrat Franz Neumann. He had a book published by Oxford, uh, 1942, called Behemoth. It's uh, a second edition, 1944. He he was a member of the Frankfurt School, which was the kind of a, dissident group of Marxists who were notorious uh, later on, Herbert Marcuse, whom you may remember as the 1960s uh, leader of the radicals, was a member of this group. So uh, Neumann, who taught at Columbia University, was probably the most scholarly advocate of this view that uh, Mises, Hayek, and Rupke opposed. And what he said in his book, in his phrase, uh, the Nazi system was totalitarian monopoly capitalism. Now, Mises, in his book of 1944, Omnipotent Government, uh, really argued against this view on two basic grounds that I want to go into. That first, he considered what is the nature of the Nazi system? Can it be really described as a capitalist system? As Neumann and Arpam Dutt and many other people said, or was this a completely false view? And secondly, how did the Nazi system arise? Now, in response to the first point, uh, Mises emphasized that the Nazi economy was not a capitalist system at all, that appearances were deceiving in this respect because uh, there were uh, ostensibly prices and wages in the Nazi system. Uh, there were private, uh, private businesses that would uh, post just post prices and just as in a capitalist system if you wanted to buy something you would just go in and 
pay your money for it, and the, you, just as you do in an ordinary capitalist economy, and people could invest money in the stock market and have bank accounts. And, uh, and one would think, isn't this just a uh, regular capitalist economy? But Mises says, no, no, this is not the case at all, that what you have in the Nazi system is they're not real prices, however, they, even though they appear to be prices because the government was telling everybody, all the businessmen, what the prices and wages were to be. It was a system of complete price control. So this is not a genuine market. It's one in which the government is telling people what to produce and in what quantities and what prices to charge. So this is really a form of socialism that keeps some of the uh, some of the forms of capitalism. It isn't a capitalist system at all. It's just it's exactly the same, really, as one a system in which the government control own the means of production. This would be one where the government controls all the means of production, but simply tells allows them to maintain the fiction that they're uh, owners of the f the firm, but but they're really not. And similarly, in the stock market, there there were stock exchanges in Germany. I think uh, they were reduced. There were over 20 stock exchanges in Germany in the 1930s, and under the National Socialist system, they were reduced to about nine. But in there were very much strong restrictions on what uh, people could do with the stocks. They had to invest, they had to, they could only have dividends as prescribed by the government. They had to in, uh, put them in bank accounts or loan the funds to the government just as the government uh, directed. So it wasn't a genuine, uh, it wasn't a genuine capitalist system at all. So now, given this, and this socialist system had arisen in part, uh, the system notion of total price control had arisen in part by uh, me, by uh, Hitler's copying the plan of Eric Ludendorff during World War One. It was actually called it was called the Hindenburg Plan, which had uh, price control over much of the German economy. It was actually uh, instigated by the Eric Ludendorff, who was the quartermaster general of the German army during World War I. He was the real brains behind, behind Hindenburg. So he had a system of, uh, had the system of total price and wage control over the, the bulk of the German economy that was dominant during World War I. He had, of course, had been a, uh, Hitler had been a strongly allied with Ludendorff during the early 1920s before Hitler went to prison, although uh, Ludendorff wasn't a supporter of Hitler during the during uh, the 30s, during the 1930s. Uh, Ludendorff's wife, in fact, thought that Hitler was really a, a dangerous left-winger. Uh, she, she continued after the war, and after World War II, incidentally, with her own publication. She had a rather weird theory blaming the bulk of the world's miseries on the Dalai Lama of Tibet. Uh, so uh, given this system of total uh, price uh, and wage control, so this socialism, the guise of capitalism, how had this system come about? Now, uh, Mises, in accounting for this uh, system in omnipotent government, uh, in one way resembles, in his interpretation, one way resembles that of Franz Neumann. And remember, Neumann said in his view that, that the large businessmen cartels were very important in uh, dominated the Nazi system. Now Mises didn't agree, as I just said, that the businessmen were in control of the not of the. Nazi economy, but in his account of how the uh, fascist e economy had arisen, he also emphasized the role of cartels. However, it was in a completely different way from Neumann. It wasn't, in his, in 
in Neumann's view, there's an inevitable tendency for capitalist business to amalgamate into larger and larger units, into monopolies. And Mises, of course, said this isn't right. Uh, Hayek also said that there's no general tendency of monopoly on the free market. Uh, how large uh, in, uh, firms will be in given, it just depends on the particular circumstances of an industry or product. There's no reason in general to think that there it's always going to be the case that one or a few large firms will dominate an industry. But there'd been, in the German economy, there'd been a, a tendency toward cardinalization monopoly uh, because of the attempt in the, principally in the 19th century, to the government interference with the free market. He, Mises stressed in omnipotent government, especially uh, the importance of labor unions in pressuring for wages above the market rate, which would be determined by the marginal productivity of the workers. Uh, if firms were, how would firms be able to pay wage rates above marginal productivity. Well, one way they could do that is if the government put in uh, very extensive protective tariffs, then businesses could charge higher prices than they would have charged had they been uh, paying market wages, and they could charge, they wouldn't uh, be going, uh, losing money because they could, because of the tariffs, they could sell their products at lower prices overseas. And so the tariffs would sort of act as kind of a wall protecting these firms from competition. And they would, they, they would uh, foreign firms would not be able to undersell them uh, if, if they charge higher prices at home. They would then be able to charge lower prices overseas. So in effect, Mises says, there's, there's a tendency for uh, this uh, program of cartelization to take place, but there was one problem here is that what happens if, in, if you have a policy of high protective tariffs, well, then it's going to be more difficult for the country that has this to get goods that it needs in trade. Other countries won't be able to pay for the goods with products of their own. And what if there are products that the German economy needs from other countries? So especially in Germany, it had a very high population uh, density, so they, need, and they, need, they, didn't, they needed to import, import raw materials, but this, they didn't have the, the high protective tariffs made it very difficult for them to do so. So what was the solution to this? According to Mises, a number of German intellectuals said, well, the only way we c uh, that Germany can solve this problem is to seize other land, either other European land or colonial areas, so they can have areas where they could get raw materials under their own control. And Mises stresses the uh, influence in this respect in this promoting this program of uh, Gustav Schmoller, who was the uh, pr professor at the University of Berlin uh, for a long time, I think from around 1882 to 1917. He was the leading, until his death in 1970, he was the leading economist in, uh, in Germany. And he was one who, in his writing, stressed very much the need for expansion in order to seize raw materials. And this was a very prominent <coughs> program of the, many of the German intellectuals. They said, of the uh, World War I period, they said, we have to get, expand, we have to get territory in order to continue with this policy of tariffs. Now, uh, this became a very prominent theme after the war when, the, of course, the German economy was really doing very badly in the 1920s when they had the inflation, 1920s complete collapse. So there, uh, there was, again, a very much a stress on the need for expansion. Was it was called Lebensraum, living space. And, uh, we can think in this, uh, mention the very famous novel of the time, 19, came out in 1926 by the Hans Grimm called 
folk are on around people without space. This was a bestseller at the time. Grimm himself was not, uh, I, I think it was not uh, all, uh, Hitler supported. In fact, in 1934, when there was a proposal to unify the office of president and chancellor in one office, uh, Grimm voted against, voted against it, but he later became, a, it, was, it was strange, he after, after the war, where most of the Germans were saying, oh, we, of course, never supported Hitler, there were no Nazis left. He said after the war, people didn't realize what a great leader Hitler had been. It was kind of an unusual position, but that's a bit of a digression. Uh, but, uh, so, as I say, this Lebensraum was an extremely influential idea, so Mises said, well, this is where the Nazis came in, that they were the ones who had the ruthlessness to put into practice the ideas that were prominent among the socialist intellectuals, that, uh, they, that various people had proposed this idea, and it, was a prom it was prominent among all the major political parties that Mises said there were no, practically no classical liberals left in Germany at the time, but the Nazis were the ones who said, we can really do this. We have a very risky program that may involve uh, dangers of war, but we're the ones who can solve this economic problem. We can get uh, raw materials, and we'll, uh, so this became an extremely popular uh, idea and that it enabled them to gain widespread popularity. They they never uh, they never got a majority of votes in any of the elections, even at, in the one in uh, March 33 after Hitler had already taken over and the, the Reichstag building had burned. I think that the Nazi party got 43 percent of the vote, but uh, and they they were but they were the largest even before uh, Hitler came to power, they were the largest party in the in the parliament. They'd become very popular because, according to Mises, they were the ones who said, we can achieve this uh, Lebensraum that is necessary for Germany to become prosperous. Now, uh, we turn to, to, I'm going to turn now to another book that also came out in 1944, which is uh, Friedrich Hayek's very famous book, road to serfdom, and what he says is, I think, supplements to a great extent the content Mises model in omnipotent government. Uh, I, the fundamental argument of road to serfdom that, uh, is that what, according to Hayek, what's going to be the case if uh, government tries to institute a socialist program? What if it tries to have everything produced according to some plan, whether by uh, government ownership and the means of production or this uh, other type of socialism where the government is controlling everything? Well, according to Hayek, uh, this requires that there be a, a, a complete hierarchy of values. We have to be able to decide exactly what is the most important things to produce, what is the rank ordering of everything that should be produced. But there's a big problem that people have very different ideas on what should be produced or what various people will think different things are important. There's no general agreement on what to produce. And if we, we had uh, tried to have some sort of votes on what would be produced, people would never be able to reach any agreement on on what could be, what should be produced. So to have a hierarchy, we have to have really government imposing its views on the rest of the, uh, on the rest of the country. Uh, and to do this, uh, Hayek suggests that to get at least people to agree on what would this uh, program, it's very much the case that uh, there's a, a tendency for the government to say, to view the people as really a, a, a unified force against other countries. 
sort of the problem with the internationalist movement, say, such as Marxism was, bef at least before the uh, Russian Revolution, was that people would have no sense of solidarity with those in other countries. But to have a, sort of a socialist a system, really, we have to have sort of a sense, it a sense of solidarity. And so to do this, it'll, it'll be a tendency to, uh, in, the government will tend to incur, pick certain people as enemies, say, just as they, the Nazis did with the Jews during uh, the 1930s. They'll say, well, we have to be all unified against this out group, and they'll tend to uh, pitch their appeals in a very crude way so that they'll be able to drum up popular support for their ideas. Uh, uh, Hayek describes this process in probably the most famous chapter of Road to Serfdom, which is the 10th chapter, Why the Worst Get on Top. Now, so what Hayek is saying, Mises has said that there's a tendency because of this uh, protective tariff policy and cardinalization that uh, the, the, the need, there was a need in Germany, at least uh, the part of the intellectual class thought there was a need for uh, expansion and that the Nazis were the ones who said they would be able to do this. And Hayek supplements this by saying, well, any attempt to put into practice a collectivist policy will lead to a very uh, was likely to lead to a very kind of violent policy of opposition between uh, the nation and other nations, and there would be crude propagandist, propagandistic appeals. Now, another aspect in which Hayek very usefully supplements Mises is that he points out, he has in the uh, 12th chapter, is the uh, intellectual the socialist roots of Nazism, he points out various prominent intellectuals who views were, uh, some, uh, who were some of whom were, were socialists, whose views very much tended to amalgamate with the Nazis. Now, one he mentions is Werner Zombart, who was, a, a, for a lot, was one of the leading Marxists in Germany. Friedrich Engels said, this Sombart was the only pr German professor who understood Das Kapital. Uh, so what Sombart, uh, in his later writings, he'd been one of the very strong Marxists, but he turned away from uh, Marxism. And he, he favored, in, uh, actually his main argument against Marxism was that Marx had talked about proletarian revolution, but the proletariat was not, would, ne would never become a majority of the population. He estimated it would be about one third of the population, so you could never have a revolution if you relied on the proletariat. But Zombart said, say, in the book on, uh, came out in, I think, uh, 19, around 1915, called Merchants and Heroes, he contrasted the, the English culture based on trade and exchange, which he thought was menial and unheroic with the warrior culture of the of Germany. So here we have a socialist who, just as uh, Hayek has suggested in the theoretical part of the book, is now saying we have to have militaristic values, mil sort of a way to put socialist ideas into practice is to have this sort of militarized form of activity and that by, uh, so just as Hayek has suggested, a militarist policy really is the outcome that is likely to happen if we favor socialism. And by the, by the uh, 1930s, when Hitler came to power, Zombart was writing in his book, uh, New Social Philosophy, which came out in 1934. He says that the, the Fuhrer, the leader of Germany, receives his order direct from God, who's the supreme Fuhrer of the universe. Uh, so he had become, say, at one time, the leading German academic Marxist had become a, a supporter of the Nazis. And if Mises and Hayek are right, this is no coincidence. It's what we would be likely to expect. Now, uh, uh, another figure uh, Hayek discusses is the famous philosopher of history, Oswald Spengler, who, uh, 
Hayek cites in this connection Spengler's essay Prussianism and Socialism where uh, uh, Spengler point said that he admired the, the way the Socialist Party in 1914 had supported the German war aims. He said that the Socialists the socialist had built up a very militant party who could act in a decisive way, and he compared this to the traditions of the Prussian army. So again, we have this policy, this uh, rather unusual uh, spectacle of sort of the, uh, a right, very, in this case, very right-wing uh, German conservative who was finding uh, I, something to admire in the socialists. So we have this kind of convergence where a, a, a very strong nationalist view with a socialist system, uh, just as Mises and Hayek had suggested. Uh, in his, I should say, in his later work, uh, the Hour Decision was actually the German title is chance. It was the Year of Decision that uh, uh, Spengler claims he was misunderstood. But what he says there is, well, economics really isn't that important. That's just emphasizing money. He doesn't care about money. But what he cares is the militarist uh, uh, virtues that the socialists displayed in 1914. So, in effect, he's really confirming what Hayek said about him, although uh, Hayek didn't discuss that book. Now, we find in the uh, work of the third economist I have to discuss, the Wilhelm Röpke, uh, a similar emphasis, and I want to mention in this connection uh, a, a series, uh, there was a very important article uh, that Röpke wrote in September 1931 that uh, appeared in the Frankfurt Zeitung. Uh, see, uh, Röpke was not only wrote about uh, the Nazis after the war, but he was a very active opponent of them before they came into power. So what uh, Röpke wrote in, the in this, these articles in 1931, he was replying to a book, uh, the views of Ferdin a man called Fre Ferdinand Fried, who was the leader of the so-called uh, group of Nazi sim intellectual sympathizers uh, who were in the so uh, center around a magazine called Die Tat, which is the de called, translates the deed. Uh, they, they were published, uh, they were a very influential uh, magazine among the German intelligentsia. Uh, the other people in the group were uh, Hans Sayer, and there was another man, Giesler Versing, who later, after the war, became a leading supporter of the Christian Democrats. But at this, what, uh, for, uh, what uh, Rupke points out in this series of articles is that uh, uh, Ferdinand Fried, who uh, was uh, actually using very standard anti-capitalist arguments, he was, was supposed to be a, a leading conservative, right-wing supporter, of sympathizer with National Socialism, but what he said was, just as the socialists did, he said, well, isn't it very unfair that there are only a few thousand people who have control of a whole lot of the wealth of the country shouldn't income be more evenly distributed. And he looked with great favor on the Russian uh, economic system. He liked the Stalin's five-year plan. He said, look, the Stalin had succeeded in eliminating the business cycle in Germany. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could do this here in Germany? So uh, Rupke stresses that, just uh, along the same lines I've been indicating, that uh, Ferdinand Fried's program, and that it was very much a socialist program. He pointed this out, as I say, in 31. Uh, Ferdinand Fried, I should say, is a, was an alias. His man's real name was uh, Friedrich Zimmermann, but I don't suppose that affects the argument one way or the other. Uh, now, Rupke uh, published after, uh, in a book, which in the English translations, all the solution of the German problem that came out in English in 1946 and second edition 47. I think it originally came out in German in 1945. And uh, uh, I should indicate that these 
all the authors I'm talking about uh, agree with each other. Hayek wrote the preface to the, Eng the English uh, London publication book. Now, uh, Rupke's interpretation is very much compatible with the, what I've already said about Mises and Hayek, but one detail he mentioned, which I'll conclude that he stresses very much, is that the uh, Nazi system was one of centralization in the sense that uh, there had been under the uh, in the Germ Germany before that, especially before, uh, before uh, Bismarck came to power, there had been a, a great many separate German states, but when Bismarck uh, came to power, you had the three wars of German unification against Denmark, 1864, uh, Austria, 1866, and France, 1870 to 71. Uh, Bismarck, uh, in some cases, completely amalgamated, all the, uh, suppressed completely the various German states and centralized them into one country, some of them I remained independent, somewhat independent, like Bavaria had its own foreign uh, uh, consuls in countries even down to through World War One. There, there were, uh, the, I think there was, a, there was a king of Bavaria was still very much active after the uh, uh, Wilhelm the first became the uh, German emperor in 1870. There was king of, of Hanover also. These, there were, there were certainly. German states remained independent, but Rupke says there was a, very much a move towards centralization, which was continued by the Nazis. And this, again, taking up a theme from Mises, is, is we, we can't have a federal system where you have a government centralized economy, because this would ruin that the government wouldn't be able to plan things if we had uh, the constituent states were independent. So, Rupke very, uh, emphasizes very much the deleterious effects of centralization. He says that the Germany before 18, 1866, which is the war with Austria, was completely different from Germany after 1866. So he sees this as uh, a key difference between, as key factor in accounting for the rise of the Nazis, that the centralization was essential. So I, uh, I think that uh, uh, Mises, Hayek, and Rupke give, I think, a very impressive analysis of uh, Nazis and show uh, convincingly that it was not, as the uh, communists and social democrats thought, uh, national socialism was not a variety of capitalism, it was in fact just a variety of socialism that had arisen through uh, interventionist policies that had a very drastic consequences for the German nation that put them into practice. Uh, thank you.